So welcome everybody. Thanks for coming out on an extremely cold night. Already, thank you. I have you back. <laughs> wow, I'm so thrilled to have not one but two former campus school grad students from my somewhat lengthy career there and a couple of my colleagues from the campus school. But I want to start out by thanking a number of people who tonight have arrived and are here and are one who isn't. I know who isn't coming. And I want to start out with my beloved wife, who's here. Raise your hand. You don't have to stand up, Susan. Uh, who, made the, who gave me a tremendous support during the whole process of writing this book. Uh, and then several friends, including John Berkowitz, who's here, and Kenny Hahn, who's not, and uh, Steve Trudell, who's coming, who read excerpts of the many, many letters I poured over to decide which to include in the new book as well as someone who could not join us tonight, and that is the outstanding author's friend, book publisher, Steve Strymer. Steve Strymer is really the man that made both these books possible. Not only did he embrace both books in terms of their concepts and their uh, mission, the missions I'll tell you about, but he, in addition to that, did an incredible job designing, laying out the books, and especially both covers. And you'll get a chance to look at them more closely, but I'm so indebted to him for the incredible work he's done, the priceless contributions he's made to getting these books into the world. And there's at least one other author here tonight whose work has been uh, put out by Steve Strymer and a couple of other people who are writers of books. Uh, Paul Richmond, who has his own publishing company, Human Error Publishing, who's published John Berkowitz, who's sitting back there. So we're surrounded by writing talent in this room. Uh, also, I was going to make sure that Neville, who's sitting right behind you, Neville's already spotted two people and now a third writer who's been to my class to deliver talks to the students. We have Paul Richmond, Richard Anderson, and Marie Frank, all of whom poets and writers came to speak at the campus school. So thank you for coming and supporting me, too. So as the author of the month, oh, round of applause for those other authors. As the author of the month at the Senior Center, I want to thank the Senior Center and Carol Bevan Bogart, who wrote the wonderful article that appeared in the Chronicle. And it's a true honor to be uh, the author of the month here. And I'm going to do something I've not done before. Uh, Call to Serve came out in 2011, and I've probably given 40 talks about it in high schools and college campuses and community centers. And I've only talked about that book. And tonight, I'm going to be doing double duty, because I really want to talk about Call to Serve for reasons I'll tell you about in a minute, but I also want to introduce to the world Photographed Letters on Wings, the other book. Uh, I want to also mention that Call to Serve, which came out 2011, was followed not that long after by being picked up by a playwright, Peter Snowd, who chose to dramatize 10 of the 60, soon three stories. I'm adding one more. I might say something about that tonight. Originally in this book, there are 62, uh, excuse me, there are 32 of the 62 interviews I did. He chose 10, turned them into the play called The Draft, which had its premiere in 2015 and was in Boston for 11 performances and then made some rounds in uh, Western New England, Westfield State, Trinity College, and the Academy of Music, and was chosen as the best ensemble cast of that year in Boston because they did such a beautiful job portraying the, the people in it. So let me get started with Call to Serve. To me, it feels more urgent now than ever in the wake of Ken Burns, Lynn Novick's, Lynn Novick's documentary, The Vietnam War, uh, to talk about this book and this war. Uh, I'd like to talk about the war and our national identity, which happens to be the subtitle of one of my favorite authors about the war, Chris Appy, who teaches at UMass and has written a number of books about the war. The most recent is American Reckoning, and his subtitle was The Effect of the War on Our National Identity. The series made it even more clear than that, that the Vietnam War was one of the greatest failures, if not the single greatest failure, in America's long and failure-strewn history of war. It was a failure on so many levels, some of which the series captured brilliantly, through interviews with Vietnamese people who spoke about the lost opportunities to embrace Ho Chi Minh and their nation's struggle for independence, a battle so analogous to our own revolution. 
and through extensive footage of the carnage the war caused, as well as revelations about White House tapes filled with subterfuge and lies. And now there's a new book that Daniel Ellsberg's putting out right now about, well, he's writing a book about the nuclear uh, war pot potential, but the Pentagon Papers, which were published in 71, depicted those lies. I want to focus for a minute on the lies, because each of the men and women in Call to Serve was forced to find his or her way through the fog of propaganda and untruth that affected their choices on their way to the truth of their consciences and their convictions. As I would listen to their testimonies, I was honored to hear them describe what they thought and felt about the times they lived in when, when they were in their formative years. I keep saying they, but that was me too, and a, quite a few of the people in this room I'm knowing had to deal with the draft, so us, as they decided how to respond to the war. My unfolding vision of the book inspired me to make sure I gave voice to all of the choices, and even more importantly, to the backstories of the tellers. So there are chapters on those who served, those who resisted, those who left for Canada, those who chose conscientious objection, those who <clears throat> beat the draft with high numbers or subterfuge or pretending they were mentally ill or uh, drug addicted or gay, or, and those, a special chapter at the end for those who loved, counseled, and supported the women who were involved in the same challenge struggles of the men. <clears throat> Two women who went to Canada, one woman, Frances Crow, our local hero, who started a draft counseling center in her basement, uh, a woman who uh, was a nurse, Penny Rock. All the stories are amazing, and it was my toughest task was paring it down from the 62, 63 that I did to begin with and trying to decide which ones to put in the book because all of them could have been in the book, which is why I then made a blog and all the stories are on the blog. There's another story that I did not tell directly in the book, but I contend it is there for the finding. I am referring to the idea first formulated by someone who I had hoped was going to be here, maybe he'll still come, a man named Jonathan Shea, in the books he wrote called Achilles in Vietnam and Odysseus Comes Home, which, along with Mr. Appy's books that I mentioned earlier, I consider essential reading about the war. Shea uses the Homeric epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey, to teach us about what he calls moral injury. Moral injury can occur in either or both of these situations. When a personal code, one's understanding of what's right, is violated. And or when there is a betrayal of trust in the leadership of a military unit or a country. I believe that the lies we were told, and which so many Americans wanted to believe, have morally injured all of us to varying degrees who were alive during that time. I heard over and over in my interviews for Call to Save, <coughs> how people felt lied to about why we were at war, about what was actually taking place in Vietnam, about the atrocities we only slowly became aware of. And it is my contention that our veterans were lied to most tragically of all, so that they suffered from both causes of moral injury, as their platoon commanders, their battalion leaders, and the generals deciding on strategies and tactics repeatedly lied to them, betraying their trust. And if you watch the Ken Burns Lynn Novick uh, documentary, you are also heard the President of the United States, first Lyndon Johnson and then Richard Nixon, in the tapes that were recorded in the Oval Office lying to people about what happened, what was happening, what the strategies were, what the consequences were. Everything to do with the war was fabricated and lied to about what was really going on and the tapes tell the story so that there's no arguing about what happened. What does it take to recover from moral injury, let alone what I choose to call PTS, since so I do not believe it is a disorder. Oh, perfect timing. That's Jonathan Shea. I just finished talking about you. Round of applause for Jonathan Shea. And Jonathan, the line I was saying when you walked in is, what does it take to recover from moral injury, let alone what I choose to call PTS, since I do not believe it is a disorder, but rather the 
only possible response to the unbearable stimuli of war. Post-traumatic stress, not disorder. For those who, of us who live through the war, it to recover from moral injury requires realizing what has happened to us and acknowledging the impact it has had on our lives. For veterans, it is about having opportunities, as Jonathan made possible in his work at the VA in Boston, and as occurs at our local VA, to tell their stories and to be granted forgiveness and acceptance both by themselves and by those who love them. Along with the millions on both sides who died, veterans were the ultimate victims of this war, and they deserve our, our appreciation for all they sacrificed and suffered, and our recognition of their ongoing struggles that befell so many when they tried to come fully home. I strongly believe the same needs to happen for the veterans of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, where lies were also the foundation of war. Until and unless the veterans of those wars get to tell their stories and find support and compassion from the listeners, they too will continue to suffer from moral injury, which causes so much emotional and psychological pain and suffering. So I'd like to read a few excerpts from Call to Serve now that will reveal some of what I'm talking about. The first one is from the man to whom I dedicated the book, an extraordinary man who was a leader in the veteran community named George Williams, who very tragically passed away right before the book was published. So I dedicated the book to him, in fact, though. To the memory of George Williams, crusader for justice, artist, writer, humanitarian, and a veteran for peace, who died in September 2010. He wholeheartedly supported this work. At one point, I was approached by a filmmaker to make a film of the work, and George was the first person we filmed. We went a certain amount of the distance to doing it, and then my filmmaker really badly hurt his back. So that didn't happen, but there is a film now of the play. And then I also dedicated it to all who gave so freely of their time, energy, and memory to promote the long overdue healing that still needs to occur almost 40 years after the end of the Vietnam War. So this was uh, a snippet from George Williams's testimony. Fear was always a common denominator. No matter where you were, no matter what you were doing, even when we were back at base camp, we weren't safe. We had been mortared there a couple of times, and one time, somebody got blown up by a mortar round. That kept the fear with you. There were so many emotions, though, it's hard to pinpoint any one as the strongest. Sometimes we'd get into a firefight, and it would be so chaotic. We'd get mortared, and at one point, a mortar landed behind me in a tree. And that's how I got some shrapnel in my buttocks. I was treated in the field and was seen by a battalion doctor when I got back to the base camp. But for some reason, the Army neglected to include it in my records. To this day, I'm still trying to get my Purple Heart. The Army says I have to find the medic who treated me. Because even though the battalion doctor treated me, the battalion doctor says he doesn't know how I got the wound. I say, I was in Vietnam. I got wounded. Where do you think it came from? And I need to point out, George Williams was a man of color. And the book chronicles the overt and covert racism that was pervasive in the war. But I think also at that time, a lot of guys were wounding themselves, trying to get out. I mean, I've seen guys cut themselves on the shoulder so they wouldn't have to carry a backpack. One guy I know drank a bottle of booze and then told another guy to smash his hand. The scene is depicted in the film of the play. The range in people's attitudes was unbelievable. There were people who loved being in combat, really to the point that I thought they were psychotic. They loved the act of killing. Then there were guys who wanted to get out so badly they would do anything. The next one I'd like to share with you is by Al Miller, another veteran. Both of those veterans were, are, were part, well, George was part of a Veterans Education Project. And they had the experience through Veterans Education Project of going to local high schools and telling their story, telling the story of their Vietnam War experience. 
and I know this was part of what Al would tell. I saw something in Vietnam that most people would find unbelievable. It came after I set fire to a Vietnamese family's hooch, their home. Circumstances sent me away briefly from that fire, and circumstances brought me back. It was when I was standing at the site the second time that I saw the form of Buddha. There was a soldier standing to my left, and I immediately asked him, did you see that? When he replied, see what? I said, never mind. What I found at the site of the burnt home of this Vietnamese family, one of whom I had just killed, was this little water course they had set up. There was this station where the water was collected, and there in the jungle were vegetable plants growing around it. I went down this mountain to an abandoned aqueduct, and it was incredibly beautiful. I had just tried to justify my killing this man, and it didn't work. I had tried calling him a gook and a communist, and all that just evaporated because it came, became so obvious to me in his death how human he was. I couldn't have imagined him being in the jungle and the way he lived before I saw what he had done. We destroyed the jungle, and he could live in it. So who was living in the creation of the Creator and who was not? There were photographs in his breast pocket of his family, his mother and his brother and his extended family. His mother had this great look of concern on her face. I knew that fear. She'll never know where he's buried or what happened to him. All of a sudden, all of the projection about enemy is going away. Now you're the enemy. In fact, you're the non-Christian because everything you're doing is against the creation. He was my brother, and I was assigned to kill him. In a way, that act of taking his life is a very intimate act, and there is no room to run from it. I should say, full disclosure, Al is a poet. He is an incredible person of expressing feelings and emotions, and he has delved deeply into the war and written about it, and this was a, an incredible gift to receive this. He had to go into a monotone voice because he did not want to experience the emotions all over again, but this was one of many amazing experiences to receive. So this one is um, from someone who One last one from the war. This is another writer, Doug Anderson. I know some of you know his poetry. <clears throat> I had already decided very early in my experience in Vietnam that this war was a bunch of bullshit. I realized a big wrong was going on, and I was not that smart in those days, but I knew I had to keep this to myself. We had two lieutenants, and the second lieutenant was someone I thought I could talk to. I had had enough with watching him with watching them brutalize Vietnamese civilians. So I just went to the guy and I told him what I thought and felt, and he said, yeah, I know, I know, but you gotta watch your back over here. I remember one time I talked to my lieutenant commander, who was actually a rather remarkable guy. He was a very decent human being. And he said, you know, all these people ever wanted was their independence. He was intensely religious and he was a school teacher, a very good man in a traditional, wholesome sense. For him to say this showed much about him and his level of sensitivity to the people he was supposed to be protecting, but so often were the victims. He had pictures of all of his men. He remembered all of our names. He remembered who got killed, and he had stories to tell about all of them. You could tell that there was deep, deep grief in this man. And I have to say there was deep, deep grief in almost everybody I spoke to, no matter what their experience was. Because the stuff that happened to them, as intense as it was, was happening when they were 18, 19, 20, 21 years old. And that's, that's too young to have to, there's never a good time. This is a conscientious objector, someone who lives in the valley. I should have mentioned that almost everybody lived in the valley because I had a budget that was uh, less than a shoestring. So I got referrals from word of mouth and from Veterans Education Project and friends. And, and this is Peter Jessup. He applied for conscientious objector status. And this is when he had to go for an appeal because he was turned down. For my appeal, I stood in front of my draft board. I don't remember the faces. I remember them all being white. And I remember them being men and suited. I had a guy I knew with me, the minister in the church I grew up in. 
I didn't know him well, but he, I'd had a long discussion with him. He agreed to accompany me to the appeal. I think you could take one person there with you. I was nervous about how I was going to do. I hadn't done a lot of prep work with anybody, but I reread everything I'd written. There were two things that struck me about this experience. One was that conscientious objector status is for those who know how to read and write well. I was really aware of that. Writing the essay was like writing a thesis. How do you explain your beliefs? The other was this sense that it didn't matter what they decided. There was a certain amount of strength in that for me. They asked me lots of questions. There was one similar to the, what if your sister is being raped question. In the end, I remember saying, basically, it doesn't matter what you do here today. I don't intend to serve in the military. I remember adding, I don't mean that as a threat. I don't mean that necessarily to influence your decision. I just mean to tell you that I have no intention of being inducted into the armed forward forces, so I appreciate your time here today. I remember trying to be relatively straightforward and not expressing anger, which I certainly could have tapped into. I simply said that I had chosen this path, and if they didn't experience the sincerity in my voice, then that's their decision. I remember leaving there thinking, okay, that piece is done now. I can stop worrying about that piece and start looking for the next one. I also applied for conscientious objector status, but I was very privileged, which was true about a lot of the people who got out. I had doctor's letters because my parents supported my efforts from a person about my calcium deposits on my feet and my curved spine, minimal curved spine, and allergies. But I had a letter from an army, from a uh, school counselor at Trinity where I was in school. And I got drafted even before I graduated. My 2S deferment protected me up until that letter came. And I went for my physical in Newark, New Jersey, and everybody in the room beside me was a man of color. And I walked in, and I, got, I passed every one of the tests, but my letter got me an interview with the Army shrink. And I, he only asked me two questions. And I can tell you those questions now because both of you have graduated and, there's nothing, and I'm not teaching there anymore. But when I, when I first told the questions and they interviewed me for the Gazette about it, and it was 40 years later, I said, don't publish it. Because the questions were, have you ever smoked marijuana? <laughs> and have you ever had a suicidal fantasy? And I said yes to both. And that was the end of the interview. And he scribbled something on a piece of paper, and it said, one why drug abuse. Can you see now why I was thinking, you, you know, we took a whole unit on drug education. And um, I walked out of that <laughs> office into that waiting room and saw all these black men, one of whom was going in my place. That's moral injury, too, I think. All those different ways in which we were deceived. So the next one is, we're going to move to the other book soon. Um, this is from the nurse Penny Rock. She's an extraordinary woman. She's written her own book called They Called Me Lieutenant Angel. It was made into a one-woman play. Are you familiar with it? And that play was um, performed in um, Springfield at the um, armory there. And she was in attendance. And I was so moved by it. And then they announced her, and she stood up, and I walked right up to her. And I said, can I interview you? Because you are unbelievable. And she and Lola came with me. It's the only interview that I did with another person until Peter snowed the playwright. And I needed to talk about it. We needed to talk about it for hours and a hike after because it had been so unbelievably intense. So she was just a snippet of an amazing interview. There was a man who was Viet Cong working on our ward. These people were trying to survive, so they'd take money wherever they get, could get it. Working on the ward or in our quarters during the daytime, they were mama sons and papa sons, some of whom did the washing, ironing, and cleaning. They'd clean bedpans and sweep the floor. Early on, this one papa son came up to me and said, I go now, lady. I want you to know, I no kill you tonight. I looked at him, trying to make sense of his words, and I said, thank you. He said, you good lady, you good people. You do good things, my people. I want you to know, I no kill you. I don't know my friends, but I no kill you. I thought that was one of the most lovely, generous acts. He was a man who, according to my country, was my enemy but according to his country, was a hero. When we are in other people's lands, we are guests. How well do we treat the country, and how well do our hosts treat us? In the daytime, he did what he could to help us do what we needed to do to help our people and his. 
to the extent that we treated locals. His view was that what we did was good, but at night he belonged to the people of his land. That's another story. And the last thing I want to read is from the conclusion, and I want to tell you the afterward, excuse me. I had an incredible experience with finding someone to write the preface. I had originally thought, I'll get Muhammad Ali, or Ron Kovic, who's born on the 4th of July, or maybe Arlo Guthrie, who did Alice's Restaurant. And of course, they're not easily accessible. I didn't meet <coughs> Arlo, met Arlo Guthrie and gave him a letter, but I never heard back from him. Instead, I got one of the people who says he's the godfather of his two kids and introduced him to his wife, George Lay, who's in the book and runs the Guthrie Center where Alice's Restaurant took place. So I got close to Arlo. But I got really lucky with the um, person who wrote the preface, Charlie Clements. I read about him in my favorite website, commondreams.org, which is a clearinghouse for progressive and liberal opinion. And uh, he was a keynote speaker at a uh, protest against the Iraq War in Portland, Maine. And they wrote about the protest and did a profile of Charlie. And I found out that Charlie was an Air Force fighter pilot in the war. And when he found out about the lies about the secret bombing of Cambodia, and they wanted him to fly <coughs> missions over Cambodia, he said no. And he ended up being put in a mental hospital for a year and a half, at the end of which they declared him 10% mentally incompetent. When he attended a talk that I gave, and he participated in it, and went up and spoke at UMass Boston, he said, okay, raise your hand if you're not 10% mentally incompetent. <laughs> and then he became a doctor and was a part of uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility and got the Nobel Prize. So he's just an incredible persona. And, he, and I, called him, I called up, he was our head of the Human Rights Center at Harvard at the time, and I got the phone number and I called it up, called up the phone number, and a man answered the phone, and I thought, that's cool, he's got a man's secretary, that's great. And I said, can I speak to Charlie? And he said, speaking. He had answered the phone because his secretary told him she was taking a long lunch. So I got right to Charlie, and what Charlie was won over by was I told him about Francis Crow. He knew Francis for decades through the protests that they both participated in. When he heard she was in the book, he said, I'll do it. And then when I called Francis, he said, give my regards to Francis. I called her that night and thanked her. And she said, well, if Charlie's writing the preface, Victoria Safford should write the afterward. And she was our Unitarian minister here for 10 years, and I loved every word that emanated from her voice. She was an is an incredibly eloquent person, and she agreed, and this is how the book ends. <laughs> the stories in this book are beautiful, however hard, and sharing them so, so generously, the men and women re represented here help shape, quote, the beloved community, unquote, Stre stretching backward in time and also reaching forward. When Martin Luther King used that phrase through the years of the great movement for civil rights that ran concurrent with the catastrophe in Vietnam, he was referring not to a utopian ideal sometime in the future, not to a distant, gauzy goal of peace and justice, but to a way of being right now, an orientation of the human heart. It is the goal toward which we walk, and it is the way we walk with every step. It is a daily practice, a spiritual politics, which requires honesty, humility, courage, self-respect, and mutual respect. It demands the hard, hard discipline of speaking one's truth and granting gracious hospitality to the truth of other people. Beloved community requires all of this and also unrelenting hope that we can learn from the past and walk together toward that future in which, at long last, we will study war no more. That's how the book ends, and I feel very, very grateful for, for Victoria's incredible contribution. <laughs> now for the newer book that just came out last Thursday. I'd like to begin my first ever public discussion of Letters on Wings with the story of how I came to write the book. And maybe now I'll say, because this is John Berkowitz's wonderful idea as my salesperson, if anybody has to leave before I'm done, everything on that table costs $20. I'm not all together, each <laughs> item. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I want to, it gives me an opportunity to acknowledge the enormous contribution of the man whose name joins mine on the cover. So this says, by Tom Wiener, with Bill Streeter. 
quite a few of you I know are familiar with who Bill Streeter was. For me, he's in the same category as Francis Crowe. He's a, a legend in his own time. And I'll tell you that story. It all began two Julys ago at the party to celebrate my retirement after 40 years of teaching at the Smith College Campus School. Steve Strymer, my editor for Call to Serve, came up with the inspired idea of involving me in what turned out to be one of the greatest gifts I'd ever received. Within days of the party, now that he knew I was retired, he called me and came to my house with another Steve, Steve O'Halloran, another friend of Bill's, to propose that I write a book begun by Bill Streeter to pay homage to Bill's beloved double cousin. What Steve was offering me was all of the material Bill had obtained via eBay on the subject I had never heard about, the mail. I learned that day that Bill had begun a book in honor of his double cousin, Henry Streeter. As it turned out, two brothers had married two sisters, and Henry and Bill were two of the resulting offspring. I learned that Henry had tragically died three weeks before Victory in Europe Day in Germany, and that he and Bill had been corresponding via V-mail letters during Henry's service in Europe. Henry died just after his 19th birthday, and at that moment Bill was just 15. I learned as well that V-mail letters made use of microfilm. It wasn't until I began searching through Bill's extraordinary archive and continuing to pursue my own research that I learned that microfilm, which everyone I've asked has guessed originated, of course, in the 20th century, actually was invented soon after regular film in 1839, and that it had been used to break the siege of Paris when Germany, when Prussia, before it became Germany, was uh, putting a siege upon Paris in 1870 when thousands of letters and official documents were flown via carrier pigeons with microfilm versions of the letters attached to their tail feathers. And it broke the siege in 1870. Of course, such stories always have fascinating side sagas, like the fact that the remarkable stone statue sculpted to honor the pigeons was destroyed during World War II by the invading Germans. Are you getting the irony of all this? Prussia, siege, pigeons with microfilm broke it. Monument to the pigeons, World War II. Germany comes, destroys it, melts down the metal to use as bullets in the construction of bullets, thereby exacting their revenge on at least the pigeons who had enabled Parisians to make it through the Prussian siege 70 years earlier. And there's that statue. And if Bill had done such incredible work of finding all these resources, that that's the pigeon statue. They're flying around and there's a pigeon on every corner of the landmark statue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But the science of microfilm, which included many characters worthy of their own books, scientists and entrepreneurs and finaglers and microfilm in the early days was used for pornography, as well as the fascinating tale of its first use by England in 1941 in what they called air graph, and then adopted by the U.S. in 42 as victory mail, first written with a V and the letters in Morse code for V mail, and then they took those out and just called it V mail. This made for engrossing research and pleasurable writing. Bill gave me tons of images. The book probably has 50 to 80. I've not, not counted them. There are so many illustrations from his material and from online resources, including advertisements, artwork on the V-mail letters themselves, and hundreds of copies of actual letters, many of which I've called the voices of V-mail in the chapter devoted to them. But far and away, the biggest gift of all was Bill himself. His devotion to this project, his excitement when he knew I would be working on it, and his delight in contributing to the book by writing and then allowing us, not us, John Riley, to film him saying the words that he'd written for the preface. I'm still wanting to persuade Steve Strymer to let us have a DVD of Bill at the back of the book doing the preface. He became a beloved friend in the five months we knew each other, and it was a most satisfying moment when I was able to present him with a final draft of the book 
weeks before his incredibly untimely death last January. He was so pleased that at last Henry Streeter, his beloved double cousin, was being honored. Of course, with, with Bill's death, I was able to make a double, dedica double dedication to the double cousins. And that's the dedication page. And I'll read you what it says. So they're both together again. And it says, dedicated to the memory of Henry Streeter, <coughs> who fought for his country in World War II and gave his life before he reached 19 years of age. It was short of his 19. And then dedicated to the memory of Bill Streeter, beloved cousin and Henry's female correspondent, who died at age 86 in 2017 after living an extraordinarily full life. And then at the end it says, Bill inspired this book and was dedicated to its completion. As for additional awards, rewards that this project afforded, I found the process by which the letters were microfilmed and later enlarged to be fascinating, to be sure. Chicago, San Francisco, and New York were the places where people writing the email letters sent the letter. And Kodak had developed these incredible machines that would put the letter on microfilm so they could put tons of letters on one reel. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. There's a great picture of it on the book cover when you look at it of that reel and how small it is. <coughs> Perhaps even more engrossing was learning how the American troops, upon arriving on a Pacific island or taking possession of a town in Italy, almost immediately constructed from <coughs> scratch postal stations and got all the necessary Kodak equipment to blow the letters back up so people could read them on the front. Mm -hmm. And these were a tremendous morale booster at home and on the many fronts of the war. The motivation to use microfilm was essentially space saving, so that more men and supplies could be shipped via air if letters were reduced in size and weight. 1,500 letters could fit on a roll you could hold in your hand. It took 37 mail bags to hold 150,000 letters, but only one mail bag to carry the same number in microfilm form. You can see the space saving was incredible. I have, a, I have a couple pages of um, statistics in there that describe how many um, planes filled with troops were sent instead of letters on paper. The weight was reduced from 2,575 pounds to 45 pounds. The space and weight saved on each fly, flight could now be used to move troops and supplies. I learned that over 2 billion microfilm letters were sent between England and America and the various fronts in the war and their impact as my subtitle, How Microfilm Female Helped Win World War II, suggests was un incalculable. The letters had to pass not only through a many-step process in order to go from handwritten copy to a frame on a roll of microfilm, all of which is described and pictured in detail in the book, but also through rigorous censorship to protect secrecy during wartime. I had three different set, uh, battles with um, rights, copyright rights. The first one was to try to secure three wonderful Norman Rockwell painting images because in the preface, <coughs> Bill Streeter said, I can't say I was in the greatest generation because he didn't participate in the war. He did tell me stories about serving meals to the people who were in Nuremberg during the judgment, the trials at Nuremberg, that's when he entered the military in 47 and 48, and he was a cook, and he served meals to the lawyers fighting to get the Nazis condemned. But he was not there, so he said he was a member instead of the Norman Rockwell generation, and he describes it in the preface as being that the Saturday Evening Post covers documented his life, and he describes it vividly. And he focuses in on three of the paintings. I got in touch with the people that are in charge of giving the rights out, and they wanted $500 for each image. And Steve Strymer, Strymer is a generous man, and I'm a retired man. That wasn't going to happen. But I thought, I'll appeal to the family itself. So I wrote a letter to the Norman Rockwell Family Trust. And they were very sympathetic and agreed to do it for half the price, which I was looking for. Uh, like 
zero. <laughs> so uh, we left those pictures out, but they're described by Bill. The second battle was with American Experience, the PBS show, because the, the interview that they did with this expert on military censorship, I thought was, I couldn't do as good a job. So I wanted to put the interview in the book. Well, they wanted 750. And I appealed to them again, and they went down to 300, and my incredibly generous Steve Strymer, it's in the book. And I won the third one, too. Have any of you, some of you I know, have heard of the cartoon character Sad Sack? Mm -hmm. Kind of like a Beetle Bailey, which the Gazette mm -hmm. just took out of the Gazette this week in favor of a unicorn heroine, I think she's someone that was in the Hampshire life, a girl who had tried to get her in the paper. She's now replaced Beetle Bailey. But Sad Sack was an incredible, incompetent military participant, lowly, corporal, private, whatever. And the jokes about him were in the paper throughout the war. And one depicts him portraying one of the difficult aspects of the email letters. And I think I'll pause now to show you. This was an incredible gift from someone who couldn't make it tonight. Some of you know Stan Shapiro. He was talking to his mother-in-law about the war, genealogy, family history. And she said she could share with him some letters that his father-in-law, her husband, wrote when he was serving in World War II. And she went wherever she was storing them, came back, and these are the first V-mail letters I've ever seen. Everything else I have is a copy. And I have hundreds, literally thousands, of copies of V-mail letters. This is the real thing. And please be careful and gentle. I'm going to pass them around. One of them contains the back flap because it came off in my hands. They're 70 some odd years old. Mm -hmm. Because so many people didn't see them, well, actually, I'm, I'm going to share that. I'll tell you the story of it. Uh, one of the things I put in the book was a facsimile of one of these letters, the envelope, and the address, a copy, a fake copy that someone created because the soldiers didn't bring them home. These were all the ones that the soldiers, this particular soldier, and this is people in my class know how much I loved coincidence, right? These were written to someone named Wiener. <laughs> spelled wrong, I mean spelled differently, um, and also someone who lived in Teaneck, which is where I grew up. Just bizarre, but please yeah. be careful with him. You can open him up. Yeah. He's given me all that kind of permission. Mm -hmm. But these were written to somebody in the States. In the Bronx, where all my family's from, for coincidence number three. Okay, um, so two billion microfilm letters were sent, and they were delivered more speedily because they were all by plane, more dependably because they never would lose a letter. They were all on film, so they could, if any letter disappeared, they could just make another copy. And um, this point was dri driven home to me because Susan and I this summer went to the Maritime Museum in Astoria, Oregon, and they had a photograph of destroyed mailbags from a shipwreck. They got them out of the ship after it had sunk or while it was sinking. No one was going to ever read those letters. They were a mess. And I felt terrible for the people who both wrote them and the people who never got them. That never happened with email. They didn't lose a letter. So there's way more to tell of course, including some of the drawbacks of email, which is what I wanted to mention about the Sad Sack story. So Sad Sack, being who he is, is a cartoon in the book. And um, we just we found out it was in the public domain. We thought we were going to have to get permission, pay money. Steve found out that they had taken up the rights were now that not, not for sale. They were available. And the cartoon in the book depicts Sad Sack wanting to read a email letter. And this shows one of the criticisms. And you'll see it when you look at them. They're small. When they blew them up, they were only about this big. And he shows, the cartoon shows him reading the letter as some of us of later years might choose to do with a magnifying glass. Probably already anticipating what might happen, given it was sad sack. One frame shows him reading the letter, and another frame, and then all of a sudden, since he's reading with the sun back here, the letter bursts into flames. So that would be one of the only ways a V-mail letter wouldn't get to its recipient. And it was obviously a 
comedic joke. Um, so I'm going to leave you with curiosity as I had and fascination hopefully generated by what I've said to look at the book and consider taking it home with you to find out way too much about Vmail or more than you never ever knew before. I do want to share just a couple little things and then we'll end with some Q&A. Um, this is Bill. This is from the preface. On April 18th, the dreaded knock on the door came. Two U.S. military men had come to tell the family that Henry had been killed in action. Soon after, the V-mails started to be returned. So the family had written on V-mails, but Henry wasn't alive anymore. With return to sender, written on the envelope, followed by the words, deceased. It is more than 70 years later, and you ask me, can you still love? Are you still patriotic? The answer is yes. You ask, do you still hate? In my imagination, I see Henry lying in the cold spring mud in the mountains of Germany with the last drop of blood draining from the bullet hole in his chest. If only we could ask him if he still hates, or if we could ask the corpses at the concentration camp if they still hate. The one thing that we know, we must never forget. And that's another aspect of what this book is trying to do keep in our memories that war, what it took, and one of the ways morale was sustained. Uh, another brief card I wanted to share with you. This is the story of that um, envelope that they couldn't reproduce. A window displayed the address of the recipient, as you're seeing, and no additional postal markings were fixed except in rare instances. An exceptional website I present is in here. And in that website, the person who created it said, actually, I had to fake the image below. Actual examples of V-mail as received by military personnel in the field are quite rare. First, keeping personal material like this was discouraged. And second, it just wasn't practical. The opposite was true, as you're now seeing, for the V-mail letters sent back home. There were neither security nor space constraints in homes and apartments, so wives, children, and parents saved female, the only tangible connection with their beloved soldiers in the field. Over the course of the war, female units were sent to all theaters where soldiers faced combat or were stationed. In the Pacific, female machine operators island hopped with the combat troops who, quote, painstakingly pushed the Japanese out of the South Seas. And then I described some of the stations and how they were constructed. So I'm going to stop there because I want to give people a chance to respond, give me your questions, whatever you'd like to share with me. And uh, also, thank you all for coming and for being so attentive to the story as of yeah, the thank two books. My pleasure. Do you mention in the book anything about records that were sent back from... Literal records? You mean like... Records. ...that people could listen to? No. Yes. The, I know they were. Yes. And I saw it in my research. I'd see pictures of people I, listening. I and it happened in the like, Vietnam War movie, too. They showed okay. someone listening to oh, a record. Okay. But you had that experience. Yeah. Yeah. With, my with uncle sent back some records. And I, I, I had them until recently, and then I sent them to his wife, my aunt. They probably were, I'm guessing, since it was before the invention of 45s and LPs, 78 records, which would have been cool if you still had them, because you I might, oh, well, I just mean the speed they would have gone, because oh, oh. Oh, yeah. they hadn't invented yeah. the others. Stefan would have loved that, to yeah. listen to those. I'm sure they're out there somewhere. Any other questions or comments or reflections or ideas? I'd be interested, what did that sound like to you to hear about something you never heard about before with email? Any responses to the whole idea of something significant that I, in the beginning I write about? Oh, oh, this is this is funny. When I started writing the book, this is what people would say to me. When I would tell friends and acquaintances about the book I've been working on, I'd hear email, a book about email. Everyone knows about email. Why waste your time on a book about such a well-known part of the culture? No, I said email. What the heck is that? That the words sound so much like our widespread email only adds to the misconceptions that surround it. 
To complicate matters further, if you do a Google search, leaving out the hyphen, which you can't include in speech, what pops up first is a website that features this definition. A Vmail account is a second email account just for your voicemail messages. <laughs> so I have to get rid of that idea and move into a whole other ballgame. Any other ideas or questions? Um, having uh, been uh, puffed up <laughs> before my arrival, oh. if I can just uh, beg a few minutes of air time. Do it. Uh, I apparently coined the resonant phrase moral injury, um, at, at least in the uh, mental health world. How many people who are professionally involved with mental health are here? Uh, I, I'm not surprised that it's more than myself. <laughs> uh, if I can just give you a brief thumbnail of this resonant term, moral injury, uh, and its travels. There are <coughs> two flavors out there circulating. One is the flavor that I introduced. I discover it in my uh, old computer hard drives in the handouts at the Marine Corps Amphibious Warfare School at Quantico in the mid to late 90s. And um, my use of the term comes straight out of Homer's Iliad, and that is that it is a betrayal of what's right. And that's what's right is something that every single culture possesses. They may collide and disagree as to what's right, but every culture contains such that. A betrayal of what's right, number one. By someone with legitimate authority, and every culture has some version of that, whether it's just within families or clans or what have you. But, and then the third element is in a high stakes situation. Now, of course, in war, we witness situations where the stakes are horrendous and mortal. And so, one, two, three, a betrayal of what's right by someone with legitimate authority in a high stakes situation. And many of the awful situations in war are not quite that way and there is a really an important place for the second definition, which is out there circulating. And that poignantly is something that every mental health professional who ever deals with, uh, with uh, military veterans knows well. And that is the same one, two, three structure. A betrayal of what's right, that's the same. But I did it. I did it. This man in Vietnam who could fully grasp the humanity of the Vietnamese family whose life had been eradicated by their action. I did it. Three the same in a high stakes situation. Now, both forms are awful and promote both substance abuse and suicide and sometimes criminality. Um, and 
the, the f fundamental thing is we have to end this hideous human practice of war, period. And that would eliminate a big chunk of all this. But uh, the two meanings still have resonance and importance in anywhere that human beings are. And the, the slogan that the little outpatient program that I was the psychiatrist for in Boston for 20 years at the VA there, um, the slogan that the, we arrived at is that recovery happens only in community. And I believe that that is <laughs> unquestionably true. Uh, this is sort of bad news for the traditional mental health model that says that m treatment for anything bad in the mental health area happens in a small room with the door closed and one mental health professional and one patient. But, uh, and that kind of work has, has great value and certainly has its place. But for moral injury, I firmly believe that recovery requires community, period, full stop. So end of uh, sermon, <laughs> end of lecture, end of whatever. <laughs> Thank you for offering that. We have someone have a hand up? Yeah. Oh no, yes. no. Thanking you for that. I believe that you're, what you're saying is very true. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have anything to offer? Well, I, I just wanted to comment when I was reading the Thank piece you, of, from Francis Crowe, um, I was thinking, here's a, a woman, she's a mother, um, you know, sort of, you know, in the, um, the 60s, and she begins to have this incredible sense that she needs to take on this role of educating um, these young men about conscientious objection. And I was just, it just, I thought, where did she get, you know, this inspiration? And then, like you said, turned her basement and invited more and more and counseled, you know, multitudes about this. <coughs> Over a thousand men. Wow. You know, when they say one person can really change, you know, things, it, it was amazing. And because I've only known her, you know, say in the past 20 years and those things that she's done. So reading that chapter was, it was, it was um, really incredible and also made me feel what, what other kinds of things could I be doing, you know, <laughs> in community right now. She is an inspiration oh, on so many God. levels. She began as a protester against nuclear weapons. And she's been cited in the last couple of articles I've written about the IRA Helfen going to get the Nobel Prize. And in Oslo, he, he cites Francis as being the, the originator of this protest that inspired him. I just brought her, she's 98, and she's been one of the major promoters of Call to Serve. She's been with me to maybe eight or ten readings. We can be sitting in a room in the old Francis Crowe community room at um, where MEF is in the right. Woodstar. We'd be sitting with 60 people talking about oil and, and how fossil fuels are destroying the planet. She would stand up and say, wait a minute. Tom Wiener wrote a book. You all need to read it. She was incredible. <laughs> but I just brought her to the Palo Freire Social Justice High School a month ago in Holyoke, and she spoke to 340 Hispanic, Latino, Latina kids, and they were totally blown away. They gave her a huge standing ovation. They all had to have their pictures taken with her. One of their questions to her was, you're 98 years old and you've been doing this for 70 years. Do you have any regrets? Instantly, I have no regrets, <laughs> and she doesn't. And if you want to find out when you were, you were asking, how did she come to think that way and do that? She's got her own book now. Oh. She's got a book called Finding My Radical Soul, not surprising title, that goes back into her childhood 
and you can mm -hmm. just like I tried to do with Call to Serve, get the backstories. That gives you the Francis Crow backstory, and a lot of stuff makes sense. How she became where she is, force of nature that she is at 98. My favorite quote of that is, uh, asked her, how many times have you been arrested and her answer is not enough? <laughs> yeah, one of my other quotes, well, and this is a good one for the day after, thank goodness, Doug Jones won last night. <laughs> a little glimmer of hope, but she says when people ask her, you know, I mean, look how bad things are, Trumpism and everything, and she'll say, they used to think that slavery would never end, look what happened. They used to think women would never get the right to vote. They used to think we couldn't stop a war. She'll just give you know a number. She'll say, look, look to the future. It's not over. She's an inspiration. Anyone else? Questions? Comments? I'm a little curious about um, uh, whether there was any, um, oh gosh, I just lost the word, uh, any tampering with the mail in terms of things that the uh, US service didn't want to get reported to citizens at home. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Every letter was read. Mm -hmm. They had thousands of people. I got pictures in the book of people reading the letters. Ah, so no, they were they were censored. Um, and there, there's a section in there where I have a letter where the stuff's uh, X'd out. You yeah. can't read it. I think I think I remember a story. Although my father was over there during the occupation period that some of the letters came back kind of cut up. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. This is, yeah. There's holes in this. Right. Or, or X out. Did you see it in the, oh, I thought someone no. might have seen it. I didn't, I didn't think to mark the page of I've that. I've seen but it's, the real it's, thing. It's, it's, there you go. You've seen the real thing. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what I'm talking about then. Yes. But they would, exactly. they would take the letter, and they, and they had like 40 things you couldn't put in. Obviously, things like where your location and what the plans were, any of that kind of stuff was obvious. But they had a lot of other things they didn't want anybody are, to put in Are you in there. talking about right. both, in both directions? Or? No, I, I, well, mostly the censoring was mostly from the front to the states, because they the things that the soldiers could conceivably mm -hmm. reveal. So, and, and they weren't supposed to say where they were, but there's a couple funny things about people putting drawings on the letters and saying something like, you know, Merry Christmas, and they'd have a picture of a palm tree. Something else that would reveal where they were stationed, and then that wouldn't get censored. So they had little, some ways around some of it. Kathy. Well, I, I was curious how how it worked. Did they did you fill out a little paper that size, and then it gets microfilmed? Oh, you're talking about the actual process. Yeah, yeah they were. The, the, so there's a blank in here. Okay. You'll see the picture of the blank. The blank is that size. Okay. Then it would get filmed. Then it would get shipped. Then it would get blown up. So you to brought that. it somewhere. Yeah, New York, Philadelphia, the three places, the only were three. State, there were hundreds of post and you offices. Sent them in. New York, Philadelphia, uh, San Francisco, and Chicago. You mailed them. You to mailed them to places. those three post offices mm -hmm. as the email letters. No one, no other place would have the equipment to process it. But the, on the front, every time they won, a, won back a place, they immediately put a station so they could do the email to any place the soldiers were. Because the they had to. went directly to the homes of the people that they were writing to. They didn't have to go to a... Oh, no, no they, they, they also, the same process went both ways. They, everything was in New York, San Francisco, and Chicago for both ways, both routes. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Do you, know, you, know, you, know, you know if it was uh, done in other places, in other countries? I only know of England and America doing it, but the troops received the mail in France when France was liberated. They set up the email stations for American and English people to get letters. But as far as I know, and the research I think would have told me only those two countries did use the email in that war. And all of you know, which I didn't say anything about, microfilm has fallen by the wayside. We have much more technologically advanced, one can make the case. Raise your hand if you ever used microfilm in a library doing research. <laughs> Neville, notice, this is the way people used to do research. Neville, we'd go into a booth and there'd be a machine and we'd put the microfilm in for the newspaper we were studying and we'd put it on the screen and we'd turn and see. <laughs> yeah, oh my goodness, now all you gotta use is one or two fingers and. This is an older group. I noticed. I was just thinking about what Jonathan said uh, about the, the moral injury and thinking that these letters, which seem, I imagine that most of them were to family members, cousins, parents, oh, yeah. whatever, dear you'd folks. You'd see that in the voice of the voices. In the letter, that in some ways, um, perhaps that helped these very isolated kids who were way off, immersed in violence, doing violence, seeing violence, and being able to communicate back home 
to those relationships that were stable and solid for them, it can't have been healing, but it must have been in some ways a sort of a survival thing for them emotionally, and that the fact that the military actually supported it to this extent is kind of extraordinary. Not just the military, they, they, all these companies, there's a whole chapter on the advertising. Liquor companies made female posters. Everybody got on board the Red Cross, and because they, there's a couple of great quotes you're reminding of, receiving a letter was like a five minute furlough, yeah. and they talked about how, uh, there's a, Eisenhower talked about how when they got their email letter, they were fortified and they were better soldiers because yeah. they felt better about being in mm -hmm. the situation they were because they felt invigorated by receiving the that sense letter. of connection with family. Yeah. Anyway, so so and it's spoken like a true therapist though as well. <laughs> yeah. Family is the, is the thing. I think you're talking about community. I'm thinking family is the intense microcosm of community. And the, the well, that inspired it. It was a double cousin. It was yeah. it was Bill yeah. saying. Yeah. I loved this man so much, and he was a brother to me, and I lost him in this war, and I want to commemorate him and honor him. Really and that's, yeah. it was 1944, so how many years of Bill yeah. carrying that for him? Mm -hmm. Bill started writing the book in 2004, mm -hmm. and then that's, so that was 70 years. Mm -hmm. But there oh, 60 were, years, sorry. but there were regular letters. Absolutely, too. absolutely, yeah. As I said, this was to really, this was a, a war tactic. This was space saving. They wanted to be able to send as many troops, supplies, medical supplies, and this cleared up space and planes. But it wasn't all about clearing up space. It was also, and weight and all that. It was really about connection. No, I'm, ta I'm talking about the military strategy part. Yeah. But you could say that it was also a military yeah. strategy to yeah. get these men these to feel better around. about yeah. their yeah. Right. loved ones. But they, they could have still got the regular letters. So yeah. that, that was the part that made it a little bit different. <clears throat> Sorry you missed the stories, but I can give you the script and you'll get it all. <laughs> this is another one of my, this was, Neville was, is the twin brother of Emery, who's, I, and I wanted to honor their father, right. Dari, who came from Switzerland to my talk tonight. <laughs> that's, the, that's a first for me. I've never had anybody as far away as probably Agawa, <laughs> Switzerland. And Emery and Neville are twins, and Emery is in my class with Julia. Julia was here, and Neville was in the other sixth grade. And they got to experience several of these poets are here. <coughs> Anything else? Anything that struck you? Well, it's been my pleasure to speak to you about these two books, and I'm happy if anybody wants to purchase one. They're all $20, including the play. The draft is back there, the play that Peter Snow created. Snowed created. I think one of, if not the best, Boston performance was filmed. It's now a feature-length film, and they're all back on that table, and John has generously agreed to take your money, and I will be happy if anybody wants me to sign the book. Thank you. Thank you for coming out on this rather chilly night.